Doc on the Run. We help injured runners run. It's amazing that we can get on here and I can uh, try to go through this with you and help you understand some of these uh, ideas that we're presenting here in the webinar and hopefully get some of your questions answered so you know exactly what to do um, with whatever's going on with you now. So but we're going to talk about why doctors tell you to stop running, first of all, and then how you can figure out if you can run whenever your foot's hurting, if you really want to run, even if a doctor tells you not to run. And then also what to do when you really want to run a race and your foot hurts, but you really want to get through that road race anyway. And then we'll talk about um, all your questions uh, at the end of the uh, presentation. So we'll go through this and make sure that you get all your questions answered. So I'm sure you've had this happen, right? You know, your foot hurts and you're out running, you go see a doctor and they just tell you to stop running because they tell you it's stressful. And they actually, they do sometimes make you feel like an idiot. And I know that this happens and uh, it is a very common thing because I lecture at medical conferences and I hear doctors that really do think this way. They really do think that it's crazy that runners want to run, but of course you're a runner, so you should want to run. That's what you do. So I don't think it's crazy at all. Um, but that's how you feel, right? You feel like, you know, that the, you know, it's like veterinary medicine. I mean, you feel like you go in and they basically give you a dog cone and tell you to sit in the corner and no, do nothing, right? It's extremely frustrating. And I've been there. I mean, I've had uh, doctors tell me not to run a number of times. I even had one tell me not to do the Ironman World Championships when I finally qualified after nine years of trying. So I understand it can be really, really frustrating. But this is a slide from one of the talks I do. Uh, to physicians about running injuries and I explain to them, look, you know, your job is not to tell runners to stop running. Your job is to actually get them to their goal race. And this is really kind of indicative of how many runners think, you know, I mean, this is from Scott Tinley, but you know, I mean, he basically said, you know, there's only two reasons you drop out of a race. One of them is if you broke your right femur and the other one is if you broke the left one. And I mean, it's funny, but it is kind of true. You know, there is very little that is going to keep you out of your goal race if you really have worked hard for a long period of time and you want to do that race. So this is another slide from that exact same talk that I do to uh, for physicians. This was a talk I just uh, last presented in Reykjavik, Iceland uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, and you'd be astonished, right? So you guys will get this right. When treating a runner with a foot injury and pain, the physician's primary responsibility is to do what? You know, should they make the pain go away? Are they supposed to make sure you don't do any more tissue damage? You know, you know, somehow prevent the patient from hurting themselves, like that whole dog cone idea. You know, are they supposed to improve the radiographic appearance, which means, you know, make it look better on an x-ray, you know, get the bone to heal, that sort of thing, or help the patient achieve his or her goal? Of course, that's the right answer, right? I mean, it's not complicated. You don't go there because your foot hurts. You go see a doctor because your foot hurts and it's interfering with you getting to your race on time and across the finish line on time. So that's the first thing is that when you think about this, it sounds simple to you probably, but it's not simple to physicians and you really need to think about this. Like when you get injured, the main thing is you have to figure out what your goal is. And so I tell doctors, I look, when a patient comes to you with an aching foot, it doesn't matter if it's an Achilles tendon issue or a metatarsal stress fracture or whatever. Whatever the problem is, that runner is coming to you because they have a very specific goal on a specific day and they want to get there. So you also have to think about that. And we'll talk about that in detail here, but you have to really think about what your goal is and what you're going to do to achieve that goal if you really want to run, even if you've had some kind of issue. So the first thing is that, you know, you've got to really think about that goal. So if your goal is to, you know, run in the Boston Marathon because you already qualified and you took a long time to qualify, then you make it very, very clear that that's what the goal is. And this is just, if you think about this, one thing that one reason I like to work with runners is it's a lot simpler because you have a long history of determining you want to do a goal like run your first marathon or qualify for Boston or qualify for Ironman Hawaii or whatever it is. And then you determine like, what is it going to take to do that? And then you work very hard to work toward that. And if you take that same thought process that you have learned as an athlete in training and you apply it to your process of healing, you will heal faster. You will definitely heal faster. And I think you'll understand that after going through this, it's not just that time heals all wounds or whatever. That's, you know, stuff that people tell you when they don't want to bother to do anything else to actively heal. Um, but there are things you can do, just as there are many different things you can do to increase your speed of recovery after hard workouts. You know, if you if you um, if you if you manage your nutrition appropriately, you know, you go do a hard workout and you drink a recovery smoothie with protein and antioxidants and all the stuff that you need to restore your glycogen stores. 
well, you're going to recover faster than if you go do a hard run and don't eat for four hours. That's not complicated. But the same thing applies when you're actually healing. And there are many different things you can do to adjust the healing speed so that you can heal faster. And we'll go through some of those as well. And then once you start running, you need to monitor very, very closely and adjust as needed to make sure that you don't re-injure yourself. And we'll talk about that as well. So one of the things is that, you know, let's take a stress fracture. Stress fracture is one of the most common injuries in runners. And you have to think about why do you actually get injured? So, you know, you've been running for 20 years and you never get injured and all of a sudden you get an injury. Well, why? Why did you get an injury? Um, so you have to figure out why that happened, right? So on one side of this little graph thing, and I usually draw this for patients um, when I see them at home. And I just explain, you know, look, you've got to figure this out. You've got to figure out where the threshold for injury is because – if you do the same thing again and you're already injured, you're definitely not going to heal. And even if you heal, if you do the exact same thing again, you're probably going to get injured again. So you have to figure out what it was that injured you. If it wasn't trauma, you know, you didn't fall down on a trail or step in a pothole when you're running on grass or something. You know, you have to figure out what your threshold for injury is. You have to stay below that if you don't want to get injured. If you go up above your threshold for injury, you know, you then get injured. And so if you think about it, um, you have a couple of options. So one of those is to basically make sure that you don't do too much activity. This is the equivalent of the doctor telling you to not run and just rest, right? If you're sitting on the couch, you're not going to get an overtraining injury. Everybody understands that. At the other end of the spectrum is, you know, somebody who's running ultra marathons every weekend, you know, super high mileage, high stress, you know, um, under recovered athlete who is obviously over the threshold for injury and just waiting for trouble. So, the thing is, is that the doctors tell you just to sit on the couch, to stop activity, stop running or whatever. That is one kind of stressor. So when we think of mechanical stress, like the pounding in your feet, ankles, legs, whatever, from running, that's one form of stress. It is only one form of stress. It's not what caused a stress fracture. It's one of the stresses. And again, it's called a stress fracture. So you have to really think about that. So with the stress fracture, if you have mechanical stress, that can contribute to it. If you have oxidative stressors like you know, even cooking with certain oils that uh, form free radicals in your food and you're eating that, that can contribute to stress. There are a number of things that can contribute to stress. If you're running in an area where there's lots of pollution and there's uh, really poor air quality, that can certainly contribute. Uh, one of the places I really like to run with my sister, she lives in Houston, we go run at Memorial Park. Interestingly, Memorial Park is surrounded by like the I-10 freeway on one side, which is a huge freeway that you know goes across the United States all the way to Los Angeles and that thing that section is I think it's like 12 lanes or something and on the on the west side of Memorial Park is the 610 freeway which is also like something like eight or ten lanes of traffic and then on the south side of his Memorial Drive which is a main thoroughfare from downtown uh, heading west out of downtown and so Memorial Park actually has some of the worst air quality in the city, but it's one of the most popular places to run. So, you know, that contributes to your stress as well. You can have uh, hormonal threat stressors like thyroid dysfunction or pituitary gland dysfunction um, that you may or may not know that you have. It can contribute to stress fractures. You could have uh, emotional stress, you know, like a boss who's a jerk, that sort of thing. Uh, and if you get any kind of uh, excess stress, then you're more prone to getting an injury and you wind up with a metatarsal stress fracture or something like that. So, you know, it is important to consider all these things. So obviously you're not going to, you know, do testing yourself to see if you have thyroid dysfunction, but it is important when you're recovering to really, really think about the global amount of stress in your life, because those are things that you can control to influence in some way the healing process. So you have to really think about this, right? Like overtraining is not training too much. It's just not recovering enough before your next workout and you wind up with an injury because you didn't completely heal the tissue damage that you caused in one workout before you did your next workout. So that's important for a lot of reasons. I mean, one is that it's extremely important because if you, um, if you are recovering and you're just resting and you're not doing all these things to accelerate your recovery, then you're going to take a lot longer to heal. But you also need to think about this in terms of preventing that re-injury that happens once you're actually back to running and training for your next event so that you don't get another overtraining injury. Because it's, I won't go into it in detail here, but basically if you look at a search in the medical literature on the search terms uh, injury and running, there are 
the last time I looked about a month ago, there were 5,063 different articles. And if you go through all those articles and distill them down to those that are actually, um, you know, big studies that you can determine some, some kind of statistical significance, there are only three things that put a, a runner at risk of injury. Only three. One of them is being male. Can't really change that, but, you know, um, being male is one. You're more risk is more risk if you're male. The second is high mileage. So if you're a high mileage runner, that is a, a risk factor for sure. The only other known risk factor for running injuries is a history of, re, of pre-injury. So if you've been injured before, you're more likely to get injured, partly because of uh, the fact that you have some tissue that's healing, but also partly because of the treatments we do to you as physicians that make you more prone to re-injury. So you have to recover as quickly as possible while you're healing an injury, but also once you're healed and back to full training. So the important thing here, though, is when we talk about this graph is, is this whole threshold for injury idea. So we're always talking about injury and we're talking about you getting hurt and you have to heal and all that sort of stuff. But you really have to remember that you can flip that thing around and instead call it your threshold for healing. This is crucial for runners because what doctors want to do is they want you to sit on the couch and do nothing, right? And that will certainly put you way down here at the bottom so that you're farther away from your threshold for injury and you'll heal faster. But my approach is that we should not do that. We should let you uh, do everything necessary to stay fit and healthy and not go crazy because you're sitting still, but you have to basically get below your threshold for healing. So you don't have to remove the running, but you do have to reduce the stress. That's the key here is that you really have to make sure that you reduce your stress and then continue to run. So you have lots of ways you can do that, right? If you keep training, if you're doing the same thing, you know, you're running on the same um, trail that caused your injury, you're doing long runs on the same surface, and well, you're obviously not going to get below your threshold for healing, you're not going to heal. So you've got to do something to get below there. You could run less, you could run on the right side of the road to supinate or pronate your foot as appropriate in order to reduce the stress in that foot. And so you literally can sometimes just run on one side of the road or the other and reduce the stress sufficiently that you can start to heal. I did that myself with plantar fasciitis a while back. The only thing I did was I actually ran on the right side of the street in the road sloping so that I would supinate my right foot and I did not do any other treatment of any variety and healed the plantar fasciitis in two weeks. So you have to think about all those ways to reduce stress. You know, you can obviously sleep more, rest more, um, whatever. You could do something more drastic like using a fractured walking boot or, you know, bed rest or a cast, which truthfully, I don't know which is worse, bed rest or a cast. They're both absolute torture for anybody as a runner, but You've got to do something to reduce all that stress. And the more stuff you do, the faster you're going to heal because you're further away from that line. So that line moves based on all those things. So again, you can run less, you can hydrate, you can use pads to take pressure off something that's uh, irritated, meditation, visualization, ac acupuncture, there's all kinds of things you can add. You just have to decide what you want to add to get you below that threshold for injury. And then as soon as you're below that threshold for injury, then you can basically um, keep training and not have to worry about uh, making the injury actually worse. So the first thing though is like once you decide okay you know you kind of figure out like um, what you can do to speed up your healing and you have a race coming up again it comes back to the goal you have to decide how important is the race you know you have to think okay what is your timeline is your race um, as I had a call last week uh, a virtual doctor visit from a guy who was doing uh, Western States 100 and he called me on Thursday and we did his remote consultation to figure out a strategy to get him through the race. But obviously Western, you know, Western States is, uh, is, a, is a big event, right? It's a hundred miles, maybe the most difficult hundred mile race around. And he still wanted to run it, but he was having pain. So he had, we had to figure something out and you don't have a lot of time. You're obviously not going to spend time recovering in terms of sitting on a couch for six weeks um, or, any other long-term things. This is like short-term, what can we do right now to make sure this doesn't get worse during the race and you don't make something irreparably damaged from doing the race. And he actually did, you know, do the race and uh, uh, it is possible. So this happens all the time. There is a way we have to figure out what your timeline is. If your timeline is four weeks, that's tricky. You don't want to lose your fitness, but you want it to heal. And so you have to do some things to figure out how you can make it heal within four weeks before your race and hopefully not, you know, ruin it when you do the race. But if you have five months out, like, you know, if it's Ironman Hawaii, let's say, so it's end of August now, and well, that's not five months out, but October would be about two and a half months. Um, that's a bit trickier because if you take a month off, 
and you're sort of in that, you know, right in your uh, maximum build phase, you're going to lose tons of fitness and you're just going to be at risk of injury because you're under trained before the race. So you have to think about your timeline. You have to think about what is your timeline for healing. And then you have to think about next, what is the worst case for healing? Like what, you know, what happens if you don't heal and you go do your race and something happens? That's the crucial part. So you have to really decide like what kind of damage are you going to do? Is it going to screw you up permanently or is it a thing that you can get away with it? Like if you have a, a metatarsal stress fracture, you might actually be able to get away with it. If you have an Achilles tendon injury, you might not get away with it. But you have to decide, you know, what the real risk is. And once you know that, you have to see, is it possible to decrease the risk enough that you can do your race and not have something break or tear or rip or whatever? And if you go through that whole process and you show up on the starting line and you feel like everything's okay, obviously during the race, you want to finish the race, but you have to make sure that you you know when it's time to stop you know when it's like so bad that you might really do irreparable harm to yourself by continuing to finish the event so you have to have a backup plan in terms of you know if you do make it to the starting line how can you tell when it's time to throw in the towel uh, if that becomes necessary so let's talk about an example of this let's say you have a, uh, a metatarsal stress fracture you have pain in the bottom of the foot you have pain on the top of the foot, you get diagnosed, you have a stress fracture, and it hurts. So I'll tell you about a real-world example. This was a patient um, who was doing an Ironman race, and she had not done an Ironman race in about five years. She'd been doing ultras. She kind of switched gears, and so she was older, first of all, um, when she was doing this race. And then four weeks before the event, she got a stress fracture in one of her metatarsal bones. So that's not optimal, um, but she got this four weeks before the race. So this happens a lot. People get injured about four to six weeks before these races. That's extremely frustrating because you still have like a couple of serious weeks of training, right? Like high volume, high intensity. That's why you get injured then because you've been ramping up. And at some point your body's capacity for absorbing all of that tissue injury from training, you surpass it, but you're tough. So you keep training and then you get an overtraining injury, but it's sort of right when you're entering that maximum build phase, when this often happens, then you don't know what to do because you go see a doctor like she did. Uh, and they say, well, you have, you know, you have a broken foot, you have a stress fracture in your foot. You, I mean, it's broken. You can't run on that. You're crazy. You just can't do the race because you need to wear this fracture walking boot for the next six weeks because it takes six weeks for bone to heal. So that means you're going to be wearing a boot on, race day and then two weeks after the race we're going to take your boot off and let you start walking on it without a boot well she didn't like that idea because she'd been training real hard for the better part of a year and um so i looked at her and said okay well let's figure out what we can do so we have a month off right so if you have the fourth metatarsal head uh here circled in red on the bottom of the foot so there's a couple of very simple things we can do. Now, now, a lot of people would say, a lot of doctors say, well, we should put you in custom orthotics because the custom orthotics will take the pressure off most effectively, hold you in a corrected position to address any biomechanical abnormalities and all that sort of stuff. And that's all true. The problem is that as a runner who is used to running with a certain type of form, I mean, let's face it. Wouldn't you agree, like if somebody took away your normal running shoes and just ordered some other running shoes that were a different brand off of Amazon and gave them to you, it would feel very strange if you ran a marathon or, you know, wearing those, right? This would this would be uh, disruptive, let's just say the least. And if you take custom orthotics and you give them to a runner who's about to run an event like that, like a marathon or an Ironman, there's no way they're going to get used to them in time. And that, so that's not a good idea. So in her case, what we did is simply, I literally like drew a circle on the foot where the metatarsal head was, because that's where we take away the pressure. In her running shoe, I cut a hole in the insert. You can see when I put the insert up on her foot, it's removing the pressure under that. And she used this basically for the event. But of course, I told her, I said, look, you know, your foot is um, injured. You've got a stress fracture. Do not run on this for the next month. In her cycling shoes, I actually did a similar thing, but I put a pad that takes a lot more pressure off of it. Now, the pad is way more effective than cutting a hole in the insert because the insert's soft anyway, and you're only removing a couple of millimeters of material, whereas you're adding very stiff, rigid material that's about four millimeters thick that will really take the pressure off that metatarsal when you add a pad. But I said, why don't you use this pad in your cycling shoes, go for a ride, and see how it feels. So she went for a ride. It was all fine. No pain at all. Um, and... 
I'll make a long story short here, but basically she, over the course of a month, you know, we talked a number of times to make sure she was staying on track, but she was very, very worried about running on a cold foot, as she would say. And I just explained, look, I think you can do your race, but you got to take the stress off of it. So go ride a lot in between now and race day, use the pads to reduce the stress in this way. And when it comes race day, you know, go hard on the swim, go hard on the bike. And when you get off the bike, if it doesn't hurt, run. And if it starts to hurt, walk. And if it hurts more than that, crawl. And if you're too far from the finish to crawl, then quit. But, you know, you have to figure out what the worst case scenario is if if you break it. And so we talked about that at length. And actually, the deal with the metatarsal is that when you have the metatarsal, if you the worst case scenario is that you break it, it moves out of position. And then when it moves out of position, we have to put a, a little plate and screws on it. But you wouldn't be worse permanently. Now, nobody wants to have surgery. And I'm not going to tell you that it makes sense for you to have surgery. But in her case, she went and did that race, and it was her fastest Ironman her entire life. So that's the thing. She was five years older. It was her fastest Ironman, which to me says two things. Number one, the doctor that told her she could not possibly do the race and had to wear a boot for six weeks was wrong. And the other thing it tells me that she's probably chronically overtrained because, you know, she didn't run on it at all for a month before the event, and it was still her fastest Ironman ever. So that's the thing is it. You know, it can happen where you can do one of these um, events and do really well um, just based on that. So, you know, you have to decide what what is important with your goal. You have to figure out what you really want and what you really what you really need um, to get through a race. And, you know, uh, I think we're going to go through a question and answer period. Hopefully I'll answer all your questions. If you don't, just because you guys are on the webinar, this is something I don't ever offer, um, but we uh, are actually um you know going to do a discount thing at the end for any other courses or consultations or whatever if you guys need them i think we'll probably get most of your questions answered just through question and answer things so these are questions that you should be asking yourself however when you um have an injury and this is one this is a slide actually from one of the talks i do to physicians and i actually ask them you know how many of you guys actually ask your patients who are runners these questions and most of them simply do not. Like I, I saw one patient who, for example, how much water you drink. There was a girl that was an athlete at Stanford and her mom said she drinks tons and tons of water. So she was actually getting osteopenia or weakened bones because she drank so much water. If you're vegan or vegetarian, I'm not going to try to convince you you should start eating steak, but I do see a disproportionate number of athletes who are vegan or vegetarian. Now, that's not to say you need to switch your diet. You need to do something to figure out what is missing whether it's copper, you know, some sort of micronutrient, or you're eating a protein that's uh, missing amino acids, you've got to do something to figure out what the deal is. You know, you have to think about what you're doing with your shoes. You have to think about where you run in terms of surfaces. And you have to really figure out what it is that is making the biggest difference for you getting these injuries. Then, you know, in the end, if your doctor told you to quit running, remember your doctor's supposed to be on your team, not the other way around. You're not going there to pay a doctor to tell you what to do. When, it's, when the doctor tells you to sit still, you're going there because the doctor is supposed to be an expert and understand how to get you to heal. But you have to understand first and foremost that your doctor needs to shift the goal from healing the thing they see on the x-ray, from making your foot pain go away. They need to shift away from that and shift to, I want to do, you know, whatever, the Houston Marathon in February, and I want to do it on this day, and I want to do it within this time. Now, we have this many months to get ready. How do we make that happen? And then when you're trying to train and you're injured, you have to remove the stress, not the run. Just think of it as math. If you have a pain and it's not killing you, but it hurts when you run, well, if you're walking around in ballet flats or fancy leather dress shoes and the shoes and the walking around that you're doing when you're wearing those shoes is actually adding up stress, and then you're adding up stress when you run, you don't have to reduce all the stress, but if you re reduce much of the stress, even by taking a little bit of pressure off of that injured structure when you're at work and when you're going to business meetings and when you're flying on a plane and traveling and walking through airports, you may be able then to increase the amount of running you can do before it becomes more aggravated. So that's one of the keys as well. And then you have to remember, you know, you've got to focus on the goal, not the injury. So your goal is not to just heal the injury and get the foot pain to go away. The goal is to figure out how you can do your race. And of course, you have to make sure you have the right diagnosis and the correct treatment. So the overwhelming majority of people I see for a second opinion have the wrong diagnosis. Uh, most runners actually are 
obviously you're disciplined, right? You've been running and training for a long time. So you are, you're tuned to healing, you know, you're tuned to paying attention, you're tuned to doing things. So it's very rare when I see a runner and they're doing something wrong. It happens occasionally, but it's fairly rare. Um, but more often they have a misdiagnosis, you know, you go see a doctor and it sounds like a stress fracture, but it's, you know, doctors in a hurry. They only spend a couple of minutes with you and that's really not what's going on. That's why I created all the self-diagnosis and self-treatment courses for runners. Like there's one on metatarsal stress fractures. There's one on heel pain. There's one on, um, uh, on ball of foot pain, which covers basically everything in the ball of the foot that could be misdiagnosed as a metatarsal stress fracture or plantar plate sprain or an aroma or whatever. And I'm not trying to pitch that to you. I'm just telling you that, um, that that is, you got to do something. So if you're, if you can't get your doctor on board or you can't go see another doctor locally who has, you know, um, a lot of runners in their practice and who thinks about it in terms of, you know, what could it be if it's not getting better, but you got to figure that out. So if you're not getting better and you're not running, it's only two possibilities. One of them is you have the wrong diagnosis and the other one is you have the wrong treatment, you know? So if you, if you have a plantar plate sprain in the ball of your foot and you've been told it's a metatarsal stress fracture and you're treating it like a metatarsal stress fracture, it's not going to get better because it's the wrong treatment. So you have to make sure of that that's, that's also very important. Um, and then, you know, so for those things though, if you, uh, if this is only for today and we're never going to do this again ever, but we're trying to test out this new webinar program. So uh, I appreciate you guys being patient with me. I'm trying to get this thing started, but this code uh, webinar, thank you. If you go to docontherun.com and you are booking either a phone call or a Skype call or uh, any of the courses, if you enter that in the checkout, you'll get 50% off uh, only today, and it, but it will expire after today. We will not do it later. So if you email uh, Doc on the Run uh, and Joan or one of the other uh, people from the team emails you back, they won't do it again. So it is just for today, but hopefully you're not going to need that. So then I think that's all except for the questions and answers. So uh, just go ahead and type in the box. Like what? Tell me any questions you have, anything at all. Okay. All right, Carolyn. So Carolyn, um, all right, major fitness freak. Okay, that's good. So Chad's mom, uh, in the six week since the right metatarsals three, four, and five, and bones are healing well. Uh, Cass pulled off three and a half weeks, but that was a long three and a half weeks. Um, so now I'm in a boot with one crutch, putting close to full weight. Okay, using extra bone stimulator two times a day, taking collagen supplements, been exercising daily, starting physical therapy, looking forward to using the leg press. The foot's cold and discolored and swollen and sensitive to the touch, checking out possible neuro and vascular issues. Yeah, so that certainly can happen. So when you, you know, the, the biggest concern for that would probably be um, that you're actually starting to get this very rare um, but concerning thing called, um, you know, uh, what used to be reflex um, sympathetic dystrophy. So. Um, but it's basically a thing where the nerves get really irritated and you get discoloration in the skin, uh, but that can go through this sort of period of change that turns into very bad chronic pain. So, um, unlikely based, I think, based on the description I see here, but you know, you have to figure that out. So there, there are nerve and vascular issues where you can get that. Uh, and one of them is, uh, RSD or reflex sympathetic dystrophy and, but there are other things too. So if you have, you know, ray nods or any kind of vasospastic disorder where the blood vessels basically sort of um, spasm, the muscle in the artery spasms and pinches off the blood flow periodically, then that certainly can happen after being in a cast. Um, it, but you would probably know that because if you sit on a plane, your feet will get super cold and that sort of thing will happen. And if there's abrupt changes in temperature, you would notice that in your hands and feet uh, and not just after a cast. So, um, but you can have this sort of thing happen after any kind of trauma, particularly when you've, you know, got a couple of metatarsals that have had a uh, fracture, uh, in them as well. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but, um, what other questions do you have? All right. So, okay, Carolyn, great. I think, so I guess that answered your question, but any other specific questions on that issue or what to do next? And, um, and transition off the crutches, you know, uh, or you think you're, I guess if you're going to physical therapy, you're probably about to finish that transition off of the crutches completely now. 
And I'm sure they're also going to address that. They're going to try to get you moving. How long can it go on? Now, that's a good question. So, uh, so the that all depends on what the cause is. So, um, if you have you know ray nods and that's what's contributing to, it, and it's just because you've been compressed in a cast for so long, um, it all depends on what they do. So, it also also depends on what your doctor thinks about it when they look at you. So, it always depends on the treatments, um, and uh, uh, you know you really have to figure out what is going to obviously get everything back on track. So. If you have a vasospastic disorder and you go in, they may do lots of different things. Sometimes they can give you oral medications, which will uh, increase your blood flow. Um, if it's if it's not that, you know, if it's something else, then uh, if it's a nerve issue, then they may do a posterior tibial block or a, a nerve block, basically, which will calm down the autonomic nerves that actually are the ones that um, tell the uh, blood vessels, the smooth muscle in the blood vessels, the arteries in your feet to contract and, and pinch off the vessels, then a posterior tibial block can sometimes help with that. So it all depends on what the circumstance is. Sometimes they can just do that one time and it'll reset everything, but it just depends on, you know, what the exact situation is. Uh, custom orthotics would almost certainly be recommended uh, just because if you've had a series of metatarsal stress fractures, the concern is that when they're healing, sometimes they can deform. And you know, it's part of what happens. We call it plastic deformation. But if you get three, four, and five, you know, you have three different metatarsals in your foot that have stress fractures in them, and they're in a state of healing. Sometimes as they're healing, the bone density actually decreases slightly because it's resorbed as it's remodeled. So in that case, if it is softer, in a sense, when you're walking on it, it may get pushed up away from the ground. But if you have, you know, protected it until it's stable enough, then you don't have to worry about that. So part of that transitioning sooner is that you really only have a couple of different um, possibilities. Like one of those is if you uh, use a fractured walking boot for longer, that will help alleviate that risk. It'll help decrease that risk, but you don't really don't want to wear a fractured walking boot for months. So if a doctor transitions you into um, uh, custom orthotics, you know, after that, then that may help uh, a lot, uh, but it just depends on what the doctor sees as the primary issue causing it. All right, so Stephen, let's see here. So uh, bilateral numbness over the second toe and the medial border of the forefoot and the ball of the foot. Sense of walking on eggshells. That sounds uncomfortable. Um, all right, so no, and this is on both feet, right? So, so you've got this on uh, both feet over the second toes. Uh, no real pain. Went to the podiatrist. Said you have fat pad atrophy. Okay, so this is this is one that maybe you do, maybe you don't. I hear this all the time, um, and you know I've I've heard doctors telling runners that oh you can't run because you know you're whatever 50, 55 or something, and and then they simply say oh well, you know your fat pad atrophies over time, and so you shouldn't be running. But I've also heard all kinds of crazy things. I mean, there I heard somebody recently was told that. This guy was an ultra marathoner, like serious ultra marathoner. And a podiatrist looked at his x rays and he said, Your metatarsals are too close together and you don't have the right foot type to be a runner. But he was an ultra marathoner who'd successfully done lots of 100 mile races. So it's absurd to think that the metatarsals are too close together, or whatever in the world that means. Um, so, you know, that's the thing is you don't. You don't really know, like this whole thing of fat pad atrophy, how does he know that? Did he see you every year for the last 20 years and you clearly had a decreased thickness of the fat pad or does your fat pad just seem thinner than the person that was in the office before him? I mean, there's not really a way to quantify that unless you have something like an MRI where you can actually measure it, you know, or a weight-bearing CT scan that you had another weight-bearing CT scan before and we can confirm that your metatarsals are actually closer to the ground now. It's not really something that most doctors are going to be able to truly make an assessment on. They just kind of say that. And, um, but if you have fat pad atrophy, there are lots of things you can do. So it sounds like your doctor recommended over the counter orthotics and inserts proximal to the ball of the foot, which the idea is sort of like that pad I showed earlier is that you take the pressure away from the ball of the foot and you move it to the necks and shafts of the metatarsal bones. So, um, with that one, it's, uh, let's see if I can go back to that slide. Let's see here. So this is this was an example of a metatarsal pad that I had modified. So the obvious thing here is that if you take this pad and you don't cut out that part and you put it right back here on the ball of the foot, 
then it moves all the pressure from the metatarsal bones at the ball of the foot back behind that area and shifts the pressure away from those metatarsal bones. And that is a reasonable strategy. You can certainly try that. Um, you know, and then it's just whether or not it actually helps you. So a lot of times these things will be an experiment where your doctor will say, okay, um, you know, if you have, uh, um, some irritation at the ball of the foot, we're going to try this. And if you have fat pad atrophy and we move some pressure away from the ball of the foot, then that will probably uh, improve. So it sounds like you went about two months and you didn't have any changing symptoms. And then you're, of course, after that, the doctor may say, well, if you're not getting better, then, you know, it's probably because you're not getting enough pressure shifted away from those sensitive areas. And we should try uh, something else, usually in the form of custom orthotics, which are definitely more effective at taking the pressure away there. But the problem is, is that, you know, it feels different when you run. And I would imagine that even when trying the over the counter orthotics and inserts with uh, pads or, you know, anything proximal to the ball of the foot, uh, those kind of pads or inserts, the short ones that, you know, only go out to like basically just around your arch or so, um, you know, they, uh, they're less effective than custom. So if you try them, it doesn't prove many times I'll say, okay, well, you need to try custom orthotics. So the main thing is, I think you have to have an accurate diagnosis, you know, so that's really important. So the fat pad atrophy, you can't really fix it. There are some people that will very few, but there are a couple of people that I know of one in Boca Raton, Florida, another one in New York city that will recommend injecting dermal fillers into the ball of the foot to create cushioning in the ball of the foot. Um, keep in mind that's off label use is not FDA approved. Uh, of course it means that, you know, the doctor can do it, but it's not FDA approved. So like Restylane is a, you know, stuff that's designed for crow's feet and the, the, you know, lines in your face and you inject that into the dermis and it, it pumps up the dermis and, and the, the lines disappear but you don't walk on your face. So we don't know what's going to happen when you inject that stuff into your foot and you run on it and pound on it. And, you know, maybe it'll break it up. Maybe it's bad for you. I have no idea. I just don't do it because I don't think that's a good idea. And I don't have any way to prove that you actually have fat pad atrophy unless you, you know, really have truly some way to document that that's happened. So, you know, the other approach is to add something cushiony underneath the foot. One thing you could try is um, something super soft. Like if you tried inserts that are just very cushioned, then that might actually make a difference. And that's low risk, right? So you try a different type of insert with a different strategy. Instead of trying to kind of shift the pressure so much from one area to another, you just try something softer, like uh, Spenco inserts that are like literally just the, the, it's neoprene, you know, like wetsuit material. So you order some Spenco inserts, the standard like Spenco green, like flat, layer of neoprene, put them in your shoes, run on those, see if it makes any difference at all. If it makes no difference at all, I don't know. The next thing would be plastizote. So there's a material called plastizote and you can order plastizote inserts, which is, um, I think it's P-L-A-S-T-I-Z-O-T-E for plastizote. But basically plastizote will not last long if you run on it. It crushes down and deforms very quickly, but it's very soft and absorbs uh, force and pressure very effectively. So if you try plastizote inserts, it's going to feel a little weird when you run on them, but it's a whole lot softer. And if that helps, plastizote is kind of like the gold standard for um, removing pressure underneath the ball of the foot when somebody has a lot of pain. More often, that's in somebody that has rheumatoid arthritis, you know, that really has had a lot of not just fat pad atrophy, the fat pad actually moves out of the way when you have rheumatoid arthritis and then the bones are just pushing on the skin. Um, but you know, you could try some of those and, and I would say probably try those before custom orthotics because, um, you don't want to wind up with, um, uh, you know, custom orthotics is a fit, particularly if they're not, if they're not working for you, you don't want to use them all the time. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But, uh, so you have to find out what the real issue is. And if you try some other things and you don't get it better at all, but you need to reevaluate. So, you know, one option is to, get an extremity ultrasound. So if your doctor doesn't do it, you can find another one who does. For example, in this area, uh, I send everybody to a guy named Dr. Tagados. Dr. Tagados is awesome. He is a musculoskeletal radiologist who has this obsession with extremity ultrasound. And he will do these procedures and he will literally call me while he is working on your foot and say, 
you know, look, Chris, I'm talking to so-and-so and this is what I see. Uh, should we do this? You know, should I try to drain this? Do you want me to, you know, inject some steroid in there, given what we see here, because I think this is what's really going on. And he's very, very good. But the problem with ultrasound is it's very technically dependent. If you're really good at it, um, you can get a really good accurate diagnosis with many of these things, including nerve injuries where you have a neuroma that seems like something else. So, um, so, you know, getting an extremity ultrasound may, may really help, but you don't get numbness from fat pad atrophy. You get numbness because you're irritating a nerve. So if you're, if you just ignore it, then you can wind up with permanent numbness or permanent nerve pain. So if you're not getting better, uh, and your doctor says, well, I think you have fat pad atrophy, they may not want to inject corticosteroids around the nerve because they're concerned that if they inject corticosteroids around the nerve, that the corticosteroids could actually stop the inflammation around the nerve and improve the nerve, but they could break up or sort of dissolve or atrophy the actual fat pad that's there. And they would be hesitant to do it because they already think maybe you have fat pad atrophy. So they don't really want to atrophy the fat pad anymore and they don't want to make it any worse. So that becomes one of the situations where you got to get a second opinion and really figure out what the deal is, you know? And so, I mean, the ball of foot pain course may be helpful because I go through that and talk about how to really, you know, diagnose that and how to figure out yourself, whether or not that's the real issue. But in that course, I don't really talk about fat pad atrophy because one, you can't really change it. And number two, I think it's extremely rare that fat pad atrophy is really the primary cause of pain in the ball of the foot um, in runners. So, you know, you've really got to get the right diagnosis for you though. Um, and I wouldn't, I don't think anybody who's a runner should stop running. That's the bottom line. I think you have to figure out how to get it under control and get, you know, without making it worse. But if you're running and you're getting more tingling, more burning, more numbness or whatever, then you are appropriately concerned about getting permanent nerve damage. That doesn't mean you're going to, but you don't want to do that if you're worried about it. So you have to get it under control and get it moving in the right direction. The only problem with nerve issues, well, one problem, the biggest problem, is they get better very, very slowly. So if you do something to reduce the inflammation, like contrast bath soaks or an injection or something like that, and it improves a lot, that's a really good sign. But it may also take a long time to get really uh, to the point where you can run without pain because nerves improve very, very slowly. You know, if you basically pull your... Um, you know, quadriceps or something, you have a muscle strain from running downhill on, during an ultra marathon or something, it may be extremely painful, but it'll heal pretty quickly. You know, it hurts a lot initially. And then a few days later, you, you know, it's definitely improved. And then suddenly it's only hurts when you run or do squats or something. Nerves don't improve that quickly. They take a long time to heal. So um, muscles heal really quickly. Tendons and ligaments heal a bit slower. And nerves heal really slowly. So with nerves, the crucial part when you're trying to run, you're trying to train, you're trying to figure out whether or not your nerve injury is going to be permanently worse if you keep training, is to monitor it in really closely. So there's a, um, a pain journal uh, episode I did on the podcast. If you go to docontherun.com and just click on the podcast link, it takes you to every podcast episode. And I think there's a search box, but basically you just look for the one on pain journal and there's a, a free like PDF for uh, on that page where you at the bottom of the show notes where you can just download it and you can use that, but you need to track it. So you've got to keep very close tabs on what your pain is like, because it's going to get better uh, gradually over time. And it, and it's subtle changes that happen. So, you know, you, you're not going to have these big dramatic changes when you have a nerve injury that's actually improving, but if it's getting better, even if it's taking a long time and you're able to continue to run, yet you can tell that your pain is still over time trending downward and, you know, your pain level is going down, the amount of numbness or the amount of tingling or the amount of burning pain is going down over time, you can still continue to run. But that, again, comes back to that timeline we talked about. You know, if you have um, uh, pain and, and you're worried that you have to do Ironman Hawaii in two weeks, well, you, you can't wait for that process. You have to come up with a different strategy. If you're just trying to make sure that you can continue to run because you love running, well, then you can afford to do that because you're already running a lot less right now. So if you're still running some and um, and you can you can get it to heal and you know that you're healing, but it's going to take many months for it to heal, who cares? That's better than not running for many months. And my concern would be that if you didn't run at all, 
um, because you felt like you might heal faster if you didn't run at all. If you don't run for months, you're probably going to get a different overtraining injury as soon as you start running again. So you've got to try to do whatever you can, you know, preferably running, but if not running, then cycling or, you know, running on an ultra G treadmill where it reduces gravity, those things can help. But you've got to try to figure out how to keep moving and maintain your running fitness so that you don't get a different injury later. But, you know, in short, you know, the, the numbness can take a long time to resolve. And because it takes a long, long time to resolve completely, you know, you've got to figure out some way to stay fit in the interim. I mean, for example, sometimes it comes back, sometimes it doesn't. I'll tell you, for me personally, I had a reconstructive knee surgery where it's a long time ago, but I used to race motorcycles professionally uh, back before I went to medical school. Uh, and I had um, a reconstructive knee surgery where they repaired my uh, anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate ligament, and I completely tore my medial collateral ligament. So I had a lot of work done, you know, some gigantic screws put in my knee. Um, they took out part of my patellar tendon. They flayed the whole thing open. Um, and I had lots of nerve damage from that. Uh, most of my knee was numb, completely numb for a period of years where if I knelt, if I was kneeling down, it actually felt like my knee was on rubber. Um, and it was very strange. It actually was, it felt numb and weird if I would wear, uh, pants that had any kind of texture. Like if I wore something like you know, like corduroy or something that had like a lot of texture or really stiff jeans, it was too irritating. I just, cause it would feel like the, the pants were getting caught on my knee, but they weren't, it was just the weird sensations that took literally years for that to go away. Um, and it can take a very long time. So there's no typical with nerves, you know, it's just that you have to watch very carefully the, the trend and you have to make sure you're either getting better or you're getting worse with nerve issues. They kind of don't stay the same. So if you're definitely getting worse, you need to very carefully reassess and figure out what you can do to remove the pressure from the nerve, um, decrease the irritation of the nerve, and get the inflammation around the nerve to calm down. That's part of what's in the, uh, the ball of foot pain course. And I honestly don't remember. I think we made a shorter version of it that was the just the neuroma course, which is similar, but... Um, much, much shorter. Uh, the ball of foot pain course has everything in there about all those strategies, but you just have to do something. So it does sound like in your case, though, the first thing would be to try the Spenco insert. So Spenco originally was just an inlay, basically cut out like the inside of the shape of your shoe that was green neoprene. Uh, I think it's about two or three millimeters thick and it's flat. Well, since that time, Spenco has come out with a number of different orthotic over-the-counter orthotic inserts that have you know a heel cup and an arch support built into them but i don't think you should try all that because then you're adding two different things you're adding the cushion of the neoprene but you're also adding the change in position of your foot because of the arch support and the heel cup that goes around the heel so you know i think you need to try things one at a time and if you're just trying to see if you know a little bit more cushion a little bit more softness actually makes a difference, then I would go with just the straight standard neoprene ones that are essentially flat. And it's just a layer of neoprene that's cut out that you can put in your shoes uh, so that it causes a little more, it's a little more cushion. That's what I would start with is those. Um, but I, you know, it is a, it is a difficult thing when you have a nerve issue, just because it can be very frustrating and take a very, very long time to heal. But if you're really diligent about tracking your pain, you can always, you know, figure out whether or not, um, uh, you're improving and moving in the right direction. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. Okay. Carolyn. Yeah. Thanks for coming on Carolyn and, uh, Steven, you have any other questions? All right. My pleasure. Well, I thank you both of you for coming on. Um, you know, if you have additional questions or you want to schedule a Skype call or a phone call or any of the courses, um, which are all on docontherun.com. So on docontherun.com, the call options are just under ask the expert or talk to the expert, whatever it is. I think it's talk to the expert. And then um, all of the courses are there under the, uh, where there's a products page. Uh, if you go there, all the courses are listed, but they're all video courses where I basically walk through and explain all the strategies about how to reduce pain, reduce stress to a specific structure when you have pain in the ball of the foot or you've had a stress fracture which covers all those things stress fractures plantar plate sprains neuromas all this stuff it does happen in the ball of the foot that can cause those kind of pains that can often be very difficult to to take care of and it can be very misleading but i appreciate you guys coming on and 
um, asking your questions and also being patient. Uh, thanks a lot. I will um, see if we can have this as a webinar replay. I'll try to uh, have it available so that you can see it again. If you if you want to review it, uh, I'll try to email it to, um, to you so that you can review it if needed. Um, but again, thanks for coming on and um, hope you both have a great day and uh, figure out what you need to do to get back to running as quickly as possible. Doc on the run. We help injured runners run.